Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. Melito of Sardis, who died in 180. Melito, or Melito if you prefer, moved us from a soteriological understanding of sonship. Wait a minute, what is soteriological? Salvation. So thinking about how it is that Christ saves, he moved us from that to a more metaphysical understanding. Wait a minute. Before we were focused on how it is that Christ saves us, he's got to start taking us into metaphysics and, and getting us thinking about who is Christ in some abstract world of thought. So he argued that Jesus isn't God's son because of what Jesus does, which is really the biblical view, but because of Jesus' nature. That's a very Greek way of looking at it. Remember the Jews? Jesus is God because of what Jesus does. That's the biblical Jewish view, the Semitic view. He's Greek. Jesus is not God's son because of what Jesus does, but because of who Jesus is. And what does that mean then? For the Jews, Jesus becomes most fully God in time because everything at the end is perfect, so we're moving toward that. Jesus becomes more perfect as he goes along. No. For Melito, a Greek, Jesus is perfect from the beginning. From the moment when he's born, boom, he's God. So what does that do? That means that anything after December the 25th, anything after Jesus' birth, means nothing. He was already perfect. Is that biblical? Not biblical at all. The biblical notion was that of this progression of what Jesus did over time. But Melito had this different understanding that what happened after, after Jesus' birth was not important because Jesus was fully God from the moment of birth and before. And so he takes this biblical notion, which is very concrete, and, and focused on what Jesus did and made it this conversation about abstract nature, who Jesus was. And so with Melito, we can credit him because from that time forward, Jesus looks less and less like us and is entering creation from without because of our sin. Jesus is God coming down to save us because Adam sinned. And if that's the case, then there's no imminent trinity for a person like Melito. There's just the economic trinity of God coming and saving us. God doesn't exist as three persons in God's self, the imminent trinity. For Melito, that's not the conversation. The conversation is about God, it's about this economic trinity. God steps in and saves us because of our sin. Celsus, do we remember that name? He was the one who said that Mary was raped by the Roman soldier. Yikes. I mean, Celsus had, had a few things that ruffled people's feathers in a big way. He was, he was an opponent of Christianity. He tried to put down Christianity. Celsus, in the second century, said then that uh, you cannot be Christian and follow Greek metaphysics, so you make up your mind. Are you going to be Greek or are you going to be Christian? Because you can't be them both. Because he says, for instance, God is absolutely immutable, fancy word for unchangeable, unchanging. And if God is unchanging, what happened, what are you Christians saying happened in Jesus? That God, what? Became flesh? That is heresy, said Celsus. He said, you Christians, you can't believe both metaphysics, because Greek metaphysics says that God is unchanging. Remember how it is the divine is like the opposite of the human? God is unchanging. Humans, we change every moment. He said, if you believe that God is unchanging, what are you saying? Listen to yourselves. God, the word became flesh? You can't be Greek and Christian at the same time. That was his argument. He said, God cannot become human because the incarnation is absolutely impossible. It's impossible for the divine, which is everything opposite of human, to become human. That is absolutely impossible impossible. For God to become flesh, as you Christians believe, either God had to change and no longer be God, because you can't become the opposite. Either God had to change, which is impossible, or there was some deceit on God's behalf. Maybe God seemed to be human, but there's no way that God, which is totally opposite of human, can become human. He said you cannot be a rational 
a logical Greek and Christian at the same time. Ooh, how are we going to counter that one? Other thoughts that were swirling about back in that time? Modalism? Modalism is a heresy in which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct names for God based on activities in creation, creating, redeeming, and sustaining. How it is that, for instance, we give names to God based on what God is doing with no distinction of person. So God is one God that we just give other names to based on what God's doing at the moment. Oh, if God's saving at the moment? Oh, then that's God the Son. Wait a minute. Follow me? There's no distinction of persons in God, which is why the, the heresy of modalism was condemned as heresy, as heterodox. Subordinationism, how it is that Jesus was not God, but is somehow subordinate to God. We have God and we have Jesus, but they're not on the same level, right? That Jesus is subordinate to God. Two different types there, adoptionist subordination and non-adoptionist. Adoptionist is how it was that Jesus was a man like us. Follow me now. Jesus was a man, born like any other man, like Christopher here in the room. But then the Logos descended on Christopher, and suddenly Christopher was divinized. That's how Jesus was. Regular man like any of us, Logos came down, divinized, divinized him. And so at that point forward, when the Logos came down on Christopher, what happened? He was adopted into God's sonship at that moment of his divinization. That was essentially the theory with adoptionist subordinationism. So is Christopher fully divine? No. He was adopted by God. Adopted into sonship at that moment of his divinization. Paul of Samosata said, Jesus' Jesus's adoption occurred throughout his life as a progressive simulation of the divine. So it's sort of like, throughout his life, God was adopting him more and more into God's self. What's the problem with that, though? Does the word really become flesh in that model? Christopher remains Christopher, even if he's divinized. Non-adoptionist subordination, without talking about the adoptionist, Arius was the one who we called the Council of Nicaea to condemn Her Arius because of the division that that had caused and continued to cause for centuries after that. Why? Because Arius believed that the Son was a, the first creature of the Father. God the Father created God the Son. What does that do? In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God? No. Arius said, God created the Word. And the challenge in all of this is simply that until the year 381, <laughs> so we talked about the Council of Nicaea in, 320, in, in the early 4th century, it would be, wouldn't be until 381 that we actually started to define our Christological doctrine and how it is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are related. So for the first nearly 400 years of the church, free we, we were freelancing. <laughs> we didn't have the same understanding that we have today. We